Melanie Marie Boyer, the Executive Director of the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for joining us for our Latino Pittsburgh Digital Speaker Series, sponsored by Coca-Cola. Thanks, guys. Today, we're going to be speaking with Fred Brown, the President and CEO of the Forbes Funds. Welcome, Fred. How are you? Great. How are you? Thanks for having me, Melanie. Absolutely. We are so excited to have you. You guys are making huge waves in the Pittsburgh area. And today we want to little, learn a little bit about you and the Forbes funds and all the things you guys are accomplishing. So to kick it off, I would love for you to introduce yourself with maybe a little bit of your background as well. Certainly. My name is Fred Brown. I'm president and CEO of the Forbes funds. I'm a longtime resident of the city of Pittsburgh, born and raised. Um, I've had numerous jobs and opportunities within the, you know, Pittsburgh ecosystem. I've been a school teacher, probation officer, nonprofit leader, therapist, activist, um, president, CEO, executive director, associate director, football coach, basketball coach, track coach, after school program director. Uh, you name it, I've kind of done it all. I love that. And that I think that's one of the reasons why you just connect so well with the community. You have this huge variety of backgrounds and you've worked with all different types of individuals. How did you come to working at the Forbes Funds? That's a great question. Um, I had just recently uh, was at the Homewood Children's Village. I had, I had just left the Kingsley Association. So let me back up. In 2009, I returned to Pittsburgh after leaving um, for a few years to work in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I commuted for six years between Charlotte and Pittsburgh, worked at the Kingsley Association, and um, had the good opportunity and pleasure of working with the uh, Lomer Consensus Group through the Kingsley Association and developed a series of on the ground trainings that increased the green IQ of Lorma residents that in 2014 resulted in the Lorma community receiving a $30 million Choice Neighborhoods Award. That award propelled our work exponentially into new markets for people to really explore our regenerative grassroots approach. And also it offered an opportunity for me to apply for uh, the president and CEO's position at the home of Children's Village. Uh, upon taking that job in a two-year period, we had some significant increases, doubled our budget, quadrupled our staff a little bit, uh, quadrupled our partners, um, and really, you know, had this two-tiered approach where we were working concurrently on operating from the theory of change that Harvard had created, basically saying if you invest in adults, you can increase kid outcomes. And so we did a two-gen model. And then we also looked at this exploration of how can you build community within the nonprofit ecosystem to create authentic and sustainable relationships. And so that required a deeper dive into our internal staff processing, a, re, a remake or revision of how we function from a professional acumen perspective. And then this North Star construct, like how do we look at bigger ideas? That work, um, gained some recognition downtown. And as a result of that work, um, I was asked to apply to be the president and CEO of the Forbes Funds. Um, I was honored to be asked. And as such, um, I had a BHAG, I had a big idea. And so I, I shared my big idea with the board and they, they adopted it. They thought it was a good idea. And so that took us on the odyssey that I've been on now for the past four years. I love that. So what was your big idea? So my big idea was because I had over 30 years of working in the nonprofit sector, mm -hmm. I believe that one of the critical challenges that we had was that there wasn't a lack of resources. There was really a lack of strategic collaboration and partnerships. And so we thought that if we re-centered our work on a human-centered design framework and that we optimize how nonprofits work together through the utilization of the social determinants of health. And then we made a clear statement to all potential grantees that we don't believe 
no one organization can solve the day's problems by themselves. And that mantra really says that the social phenomena confronted by every organization is so complex today that it requires strategic collaborations in ways we have not considered or imagined. And so the impetus of that pivot allowed us to freeze our assets and restructure our grant making and within our first year of relaunching our program, we increased our grant making by 400%. The second thing we did was we stopped calling grantees grantees, and we called them partners that we invested in because we felt like our resource wasn't enough to just, we had to make it more than money, which uh, I kind of adopted from Michelle, Mc, Michelle McMurray from the Pittsburgh Foundation. She talks about small and mighty being more than money. And I agree wholeheartedly that our connection, our platform, our network is more than money. Yes, you can get a grant from us and yes, you can act transactionally, but we believe the greater asset is leveraging our network and co-creating and being a thought partner with us around draw, uh, assessing and drawing correlation to how we address BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious ideas or goals. I absolutely love that because I say every day at some point we go further together, right? And looking at it from the perspective of um, the losing that power dynamic where we're the funders and you're the fund E versus we're partners, it creates a, definitely a more symbiotic and equitable relationship in my opinion. So I, I absolutely love that. So tell me a little bit um, on, on the website, which I hope that you guys check out. It's ForbesFunds.org. Your headline is where leaders and communities evolve together. We've already touched on that a little bit, but can you expand into especially why this is your main message? That's a terrific question. So in 20, 2018, when I came on board, we froze our assets. We had the good fortune of working with the London School of Systems Change out of London. And we were granted six content experts to help us rethink our work through micro level systems application. And so once we began to look at that work, we began to look at a global context to our work in Pittsburgh, which required us to reverse engineer our work. And so we did two things. One, we adopted the um, social determinants of health as a core construct for our work and all of our grant making so that we can better track that work. And the second one was we reverse engineered all of our outputs to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. During that same year, we partnered with the city of Pittsburgh and went to New York and worked with them at the Rockefeller Foundation and helped the city of Pittsburgh become the second US city to adopt the United Nations, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And after that, um, we were able to uh, become members of the RSA, the Royal Society of Arts, Manufacturing, and Commerce. Then we recently were elected into the Club of Rome. Uh, we're a part of four international think tanks. And so we just began to offer solutions to the world that were being recognized globally as um, universally applicable. And so people began to ask us to speak at certain events, do podcasts. And so we began to have this really robust exchange where we were sharing our ideas across the pond. Um, most recently, I was asked to be a keynote speaker at the Nexus Global Conference in Aqaba, um, which I think took place in October. And it was a life transforming experience. The other thing I thought was critical is that we drew a clear line of distinction between transactional and transformational work. And we also shifted over the last four years, we're, we're on our fifth pivot, but our first pivot in induction to adopting the UN SDGs and the social determinants of health was moving into systems change and really understanding systems at the micro, meso, macro, and global level and exploring the mediating informal and formal service delivery units and saying, at the nonprofit level, level, what role do each of these systems play? Can we increase their trajectory, velocity, ability to collaborate, can we enhance their ability to be collaborative in nature and increase their impact exponentially? Can we optimize the way they share their work 
to increase effectiveness and efficiency. And so that became the key thing we focused on. And while we were doing that work, we um, were fortunate enough to meet with Nora Bateson out of Sweden from the International Basin Institute. And that relationship allowed us to explore uh, warm data labs. And so we launched a international training in Pittsburgh for 30 people from around the world um, to participate in the warm data labs and then COVID hit. And at the conclusion of COVID, we were able to partner with Nora and create a virtual framework called People Need People. And that framework really allowed us to explore um, how you deal with physical distancing and social isolation during COVID, and how you construct frameworks to really move people um, from the theoretical to the metaphysical while they're in a virtual world. And so it's be it became a very daunting task to deconstruct conversations virtually and move them into practical applications. But we were fortunate to um, have a partnership with Headstorm and our team co-created a new human-centered design in the box construct that we've been utilizing for the past two years that really merged together the virtual and the physical to create a new, what I would call regenerative model. There's so many things to touch on there. All the work that you're doing is just so tremendous. I love that you brought up the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I'm very familiar with them. And, and I want to talk a little bit about that bigger picture. I do have a few questions um, that we spoke about before, but there's so many things that we're touching on here. Um, when people hear, oh, you're going and doing this stuff at the UN, oh, you're going and speaking here, speaking there. People who aren't familiar with the type of work that we do do not understand the value of it. They think, you know, you're here. Why can't you just be here working on things here? What explain to us what is the value of getting together with those minds of tapping in to these systems and things that have already been, you know, developed and implemented other places? Why do we need to go outside of our immediate area and region to really make change here? Well, one is Pittsburgh is a very prideful city. Our steel mill and our blue collar framework defines us as a people, as a group, as a city. And so we must honor that and bring forth a transformation of that work. Most recently, when I was in Greece um, four years ago, um, people found out I was from Pittsburgh and people from London, the UK, um, Australia, Colombia, everybody from all around the world were asking me questions about Pittsburgh. And I just was, I didn't understand, like, what was the big interest? And they were just enamored with Pittsburgh's growth around artificial intelligence and robotics and the, the launch of Mill 19. And I knew about those things, but I didn't dive deeply into them. And so when I got back to the States, I dove a little bit more um, seriously into the work. And I realized that Pittsburgh is at the cutting edge of a global paradigm shift. And we're seen as a city that rebounded from being a rust belt to a brain belt to a tech belt. And so the challenge that we have is that in that pivot, we've left some people behind. And I don't think it was intentionally. I think the speed, velocity, and trajectory of the work of technology just requires rapid prototyping. And that's a foreign concept to many nonprofit leaders as it is to many general leaders. And so I think that we have been confounded by the speed at which technology has changed the world. COVID then did something uniquely, um, uniquely challenging to us. It really exposed for those of us who did not know and were unaware that there was an iceberg right underneath the water surface of the dichotomy, the disparity between the haves and have nots, and at what level that represented people of color as a deciding factor. And that deciding factor really um, created a different construct because as a result of COVID, when everybody went virtual, it opened up the floodgates to a virtual platform for how we did our work. And so we were able to partner with uh, some partners in Seuss, Tunisia, and launched a International Anti-Racism Institutional Wireframe Cohort, 
ARC for short, we had 158 people from five countries come to the launch. We had 75 people from 43 companies participate in a 10-month odyssey to explore their organization beyond DE&I to look at implicit bias, blind spots, and institutional practices that may omittedly or committedly drive racist practices or pedagogy in the organization. And so we tried to work with companies to unwrap, to unravel those historical trend lines and to get them to explore at a much deeper level what their values are and should be as they pivot. And so that made us aware that Pittsburgh sits at the apex of global recognition. What further indicated that work is the most recent visit by the president. Where did he come to? Mill 19. Where did he stop at? The bridge. Who did he talk to? Union workers and technology experts to really say in his Build Back Better plan, his focus on the infrastructure and technology center. And as it being central as a theme, it puts Pittsburgh right at the precipice of being a city on the rise of being transformed. The challenge that we face is as we speed towards this new pivot, how are we ensuring that resilient people and people of color have access and on ramps into our new global trajectory? And so that's really been the ep- you know at the epicenter of our work and our pivot. And I think that our audience is very in touch with these things. But for those who aren't, I want to talk about something really quick that that we've talked about many times. And you touched on it that this wasn't intentional, you know. And now. Equity research study after study after study after study proves that diversity and equity increase the bottom line. They increase the the money in your pocket. Um, We are not looking to elevate anyone over anyone. We want everyone to have the same starting line. We don't want anyone starting way back. We don't want anyone starting forward. It doesn't matter what race, what nationality, what sex, what anything you are. If you are the best in your field, if your company is the best, et cetera, we want you to have the ability to excel with equity across the line, because this is, as you know, where we always get into people, people's different arguments and things. So I always like to include that in here. But before we move to the next question, do you want to speak to that at all? Certainly. I think the challenge that we have to confront is that over the next 28 years, we have what we call 10 critical inflection points. We've already experienced two of them, which is in 2021, We will have to deal with rental and mortgage moratoriums being lifted. What impact does that have on society? We also dealt with the political division and armed civil unrest as a result of what happened on January 6th. In 2022, we had to adopt and embrace the president's COVID impact and recovery initiative, um, the stimulus packages and the Build Back Better model. 2023, we need to address racial equity as an ecosystem we know during the Black Lives Matter movement, there was $50 billion invested in the sector, and we need to account for what happened. What was the impact? Is there a dashboard? 2024, income inequality, we know women of color make 54 cents on a dollar compared to their white counterparts in our area. 2025, what is the role of AI and machine learning, which is central for Pittsburgh as this evolution of this artificial intelligence and robotic sector and hub takes off as a result of Mill 19. 2026, the potential collapse of Medicare and Social Security. 2030, climate change. 2040, population shift from minority to majority. 2048, the potential death of the oceans from overfishing. In 2050, we know we have two critical flashpoints. One day, 70% of the world's population will live in the urban corridor and 40% of the workforce will be automated. And so those dynamics have a global impact. These are no longer local, small things. They affect the whole world. And and the thing that is important for us to discern is, I say this all the time, nobody's coming to save us. We need to be proactive and come up with solutions at multiple levels that at least spark people's interest, which is why, to me, we've gotten a, a lot of international notoriety because we look at ideas. We don't say, well, they only can work in Pittsburgh. We think they have universal applicability. And so people have gotten on the bandwagon, they support it. And it's really 
enriched our work because, you know, to talk to people from around the world on a weekly basis and have them say, well, what you saw on TV is not really what's happening. Here's the real crux of what's going on. That pivot that, you know, from television to what's actually going on is a real important construct to understand when you're seeking to create strategic collaborations and partnerships that grow people's talents, give skills, give some skills. And so we believe that those are universal practices that have global impact. And Pittsburgh sits at the center of one of the, you know, I would say ecosystems that could potentially serve as a problem solver, a solutions maker that has global implication. And we're, we're, we're just confident that we can offer something to the world. And ultimately, you know, like we said before, we go further together. Um, the solutions that we don't have here because of our conditioning and, you know, our background, the way that we think is different because of where we live, who we are. All of these things are all different types of, of diversity. Diversity is not just race. So when you're talking about all these other countries, it brings it brings that innovation together. And I it's so good to know um, that you guys are doing this work and you're out there and making the change. And the, all, those things that you mentioned, those are altering the way that that we live our lives. There is not a part of life that isn't touched by the things that you mentioned. So glad we're making those strides. It's a team effort. We've been blessed to have some very talented people come through the Forbes funds. While I've been there, there's been talented people and talented leaders before I got there. We're, we're building on the shoulders of giants in the field. Um, and so I don't want at any point in time to be assuming that we are taking credit for work that's been going on for 40 years. I will say that we wrote it. We're writing a chapter in the book. Um, the chapter is adding a, a, another level of cultural nuance that I think um, has not been uh, attacked in the way that we're bringing it to the table. I think our board's adoption of an anti-racism framework and cultural, the cultural construct by which they want us to focus has brought in our ability to tackle difficult and timely issues through the construct of our investment strategy in the nonprofit sector. I mean, when you think about there's 8,500 nonprofits in Southwestern PA, we interface with 2,500 of them on an annual basis. Um, you know, we want to create momentum around that effort and really have people understand we're not trying to do transactions with them. We're trying to build momentum around how we function. So for example, we do community coffees where we come into the community and ask questions. How can we be more helpful? What are we not adhering to? What are we missing? We don't come in with solutions. We come in with questions. And when we get to the answer portion, we want to really push the notion of co-creation. And so we've adopted and created a new model two years ago called the commons. And the commons is really around this notion of deliberative democracy. It's about teaching people how to look at data and read it, how to select partners in the community they can work with, to have that group identify a problem and test the validity of it, and then to have that idea be brought back to the body for voting and reconciliation within the community. And so we, on every step of the way, we want to increase people's ownership of the problem, their accountability of the problem, and the solution. And so this is one way that we've been able to garner that kind of support. So all of these things, I hope that everyone is learning as much as I am, because while I know plenty about the Forbes Fund, or so I thought, I'm already learning so much just in this conversation. Um, and it's good to know that that you guys are doing all these things. Like I said, I want to touch on your theory of change. So, yes, our theory of change is quite simple. Like, we don't believe no single organization can solve the day's problems. And conversely, we believe that we have to be constant procurers of data, right? And so, for example, since COVID, this is an example of how we operate. Since COVID, we facilitated 3,000. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> we facilitated 3,668 Zoom meetings with approximately 31,955 participants on those calls. Plus people are looking at the tape videos and uh, YouTube versions of this work. And so we're using that as a 
every Monday we get feedback from the community on what they would like to see. Do they want to see weekly, bi-weekly, monthly meetings? What are some general topics they're interested in? Today we had on the PA policy group. Um, they were able to give us a detailed breakdown on how the governor's budget looks, where they're targeting resources, um, how they're going to, how that resource looks to be sustainable um, after the infusion of the resources from the uh, stimulus resources. And so, you know, we believe that having these constant exchanges and it empowers the community to be shared stakeholders and the knowledge that we obtain. It also makes them capable of making decisions because they have access to data. Fred, thank you. Sorry, I was just pulling up something. I was looking at your website and I was looking to see, I want to make sure that we share those links. So down there in the comments, you guys will see, we're going to put the link to the website, a link to some of these conversations and things that are accessible. So we don't just learn today, but we can keep learning through all of your efforts over at the Forbes Funds. So I want to talk a little bit about your grant making. Um, tell us about how you guys choose the grants that you fund and what the process is. That's a great question. So our grant making process has pivoted over the last four years. We basically um, have created an assessment tool that measures four concrete areas of organization, their leadership, their needs and, and such. And the needs assessment is comprehensive. A lot of people say, wow, it's deep, but for us to really help organization, we need them to be honest and transparent about where they are. And sometimes people ask for money but they really need resources to fix other things and not what they are, are looking at or eyeballing, so to speak. Our grant making um, comes through multiple aspects of our work. Or, you know, one of the first things we offer through our Greater Pittsburgh Nonprofit Partnership is that your membership warrants you achieving and obtaining $55,000 in services through the membership. So we help with website design, uh, board development, different things through that membership. The second one is our executive and residence programs. We pay for coaching and support technical assistance to your institution, uh, given where you might be on your journey for succession planning, operating reserves, doing assessments, uh, looking at HR principles and, and such. Then our management assistance grants really are focused on two or more organizations coming together to tackle a problem and to use this resource to really look at exploring back office reserves, back office support, look at budgeting, looking at acquisitions, mergers, all these things that really tighten up the nonprofit sector's ability to function without um, what I would call gaps in our system service framework. The other thing we created two years ago, something called um, Catalytic Community Cohorts, where we offer up to $100,000 for community leaders in targeted, 50 targeted communities. And they're what we call emerging leaders. And those emerging leaders are supported by what we call high performing leaders in the same field. And we usually describe those as organizations with $3 million or less as an emerging organization and coaching organizations are $40, 50000000 million or more. And so there's no real competition with the coaching. And so there's a large enough gap between the organizations, but a lot of uh, critical analysis and alignment within their theories of change. And so we use that resource to have them tackle a social determinant of health and then get coaching from the content experts to really help them fortify processes that optimize their partners as well as the assets of the high performing organizations. And so so many times we talk to organizations and right now over 50% of the nonprofits in GPMP have a million dollars or less budgets. And so when we're talking about organizations that are striving to be million dollar organizations, there's a certain kind of business acumen that's required that a lot of smaller organizations haven't arrived at. And so we really use our framework to create that space. Then we launched last year or innovation lab where we're looking at the role of technology and data sovereignty and how can we ensure that resilient communities and communities under stress are being protected as people begin to process data 
use data to make decisions, um, often the data from the community without um, them being participatory in the process. And so these are some of the things we've created as well as our, our anti-racism work. These things make up an ecosystem and that ecosystem um, looks at taking organizations from surviving to thriving. And so our goal is really to co-create solutions with leaders based upon uh, imp impacting them with skills that they see as transformational for the sector and then helping them optimize the use of those skills within their ecosystem, either directly through coaching, either directly through an investment strategy that looks at building up their infrastructure or through also another new form of our work is something called the Forbes Funds University. And we created the Forbes Funds University to really provide three things. One is we want to increase uh, academic proficiency of, of the nonprofit leader. We want to create spaces for them to get certification and CEUs and college credits. And so those three things are critical for us to do our work. So thanks for sharing a little bit about your grant making process and your thoughts behind that. But how do you guys measure success? That's a great question. We've been, we've been, honestly, to be honest with you, we've been struggling with how do you measure success versus impact? I don't think there's any doubt that we've been successful. The challenge is impact. And so we've been shifting our work, as I mentioned earlier, with um, putting our grants into buckets that really encompass the social determinants of health. And then we've created this new framework to look at what we think is both a qualitative and quantitative analysis, which is um, focused on something called the eight R's. And the eight R's really, they really encompass a different way of thinking around about our work that explores, you know, how we, So let me just put it to you like this. There's always been this notion of measuring ROI, return on investment. Then we start saying, well, what about return on assets? What about return on equity? What about return on relationships? What about return on sustainability? What about return on policy? What about return on well-being? What about return on technology? And so now we're looking at when you integrate those eight R's into our work, how does that change your qualitative and quantitative analysis of your work? And then, you know, we use the word impact, but really how do we create success um, that is regenerative? And that would be the word I use versus impact is, how are we looking at grooming leaders? How are we looking at succession planning? How are we looking at organizations that have created operating reserves? How are we looking at systems that have reduced duplication of efforts and increased effectiveness and efficiency. That to me becomes a new measure of success because it moves away from individual organizations to ecosystems. And so when you move from what I would say systems change to ecosystems co-creation, you create more space where there's mutual accountability. And so my success depends on your success and you can no longer just go down the road and be like, well, that ain't my problem. I'm going to just go ahead and do what I need to do. There's a greater pension to say, I'm not successful if my most oppressed partner is not successful. Because in the end, you know, our work only covers a certain level of depth and breadth of an organization. And without strategic, strategically collaborating with other people, we leave that organization short with regards to what its capabilities are. And so, you know, that's pretty much how we look at our work. I love that you are always reaching beyond your reach. So as you're grooming these leaders and they're going out and making these waves in the world, that that is a huge reflection on you guys. Like I can't even imagine the number of people that you have helped through thinking this way. And I want to add all of the time, you know, we're, we just agree on so many things. I always say that we need to lift from the ground up, right? When we lift the ground, everyone moves up. You can lift one person up, but if there's nothing to stand on and everyone else is down here, they're still going to fall, right? So when we lift up 
from the ground up, we can all move forward together and creating all of these different leaders who can do the work out in the community instead of that funder fundee relationship and empowering people to empower themselves and their communities. That is the work that I am hearing that you guys are doing and your, your reach and your, um, you know, the good works that you're doing are exponential instead of just saying, Hey, we're going to fund this little program. We're going to create people who can fund their own programs, who can run their own. You know, it's just, it's really inspiring. And this is the exact work that we need, not just here in Pittsburgh, but you know, internationally to really make those changes that we talked about. Well, thank you. Once again, I would say our board plays huge pays. They play a huge dividend in this. They are, they've been very supportive of not traditional approaches, to be honest with you. This is, there's not a roadmap that we were given to do this work, except in my proposal, I, I told the board we were going to do this work. I told them in four years we would be global. And so you know, I was talking to a board member recently, and they said, you know what? It's kind of amazing. You, everything you told us in your interview, you've achieved. And so the thing that's next for me is succession planning. Like, how do we, how are we more intentional about, is it time for me to consider doing something different? Do, am I taking up space where a new emerging leader should probably probably be in my space. We're getting close to determining that. Like for me, if the work we're doing is not exciting and keeping my attention, it's time for new blood to come in and stir it up. Like, you know, I don't pretend to have all of the answers. Um, and I believe that we've done very impactful work, no doubt about that. But I also believe that if I don't create space for the next leader to walk in and and be in a kind of a good space where there's material to work with. Um, then I failed the organization too. I don't believe that we can keep millennials at bay without putting them in positions that have real meaningful impact in our work. And we have to create spaces where they could be mentored and groomed. You know, everybody thinks they could do the job. Everybody wants to be the boss. Everybody thinks what you you just sit around and make tell people what to do. It's so much more to that, but you don't know that until you get in the seat, right? Mm -hmm. The politics in the seat, you can't even prepare people for. It. It's it's you know, the more money you have, the more political it gets. Um, there's just so many notions about um what does it take to really make stuff happen. It takes courageous conversations. It takes people being authentic. It takes people being held accountable. It takes honesty and integrity. It takes a value system that we often hear about, but we don't see practice. And this is not, I'm not judging anybody. It's just a fact, right? Our work, the only reason we exist is because people have problems. When we don't work tirelessly to resolve their problems, we fail to understand the critical nature and I would say the urgency that's required to help restart, pivot, or explore with a person or family how they extricate themselves from a situation. Like that's our job. And I know, you know, people's like, well, you can't work forever, you can't work people to death. I got that. I'm I'm acutely aware of that, but I'm also acutely aware of like, what, is, what does it feel like to be hungry and don't have an option? What does it feel like to call an organization and they're closed until Monday and you need help today? Like, how are we more agile and iterative and nimble as a system given the stressors and shocks that are impacting the people we serve and without them, we wouldn't be in business. And so how are we honoring them in a fair and amicable way, and also how we also honor ourselves. And so we have, as an institution, looked at uh, moving people's schedules around so they can have some time, downtime. Um, we've looked at uh, co-creating stuff that we gave more ownership to ideas, to partners. Um, we've looked at a number of things that where we see ourselves as the I would say um, a nursery where you, you go and buy plants and trees. 
but somebody prepared those shrubberies to be taken from their facility and planted somewhere else. And so we see ourselves as a nursery where we co-created ideas with the community and we've nurtured them. And then we say, hey, this was your idea. It's time for you to take it back. What, what kind of techni technical support do you need to do that? What, who do we need to put you in the room with so that you can see the strategic collaboration? Here's the big idea. What are you thinking? And so we're doing that simultaneously. And so what people don't know is I've shared with you our continuum from GPMP to ARC or Innovation Lab, wherever you want to stop, right? There's about 10 things in there. What I haven't talked about is behind that is a nursery where we've been housing almost 200 smaller ideas for four years that we got from meetings with people, uh, collaborations with people, conversations and such. And so our team has been tasked with getting down 198 community ideas. We're trying to get them down to about 20. We're at about 45 right now. And so the goal is to merge those ideas where we can to provide ownership back to the community to restore their idea as their idea and to provide technical assistance to ensure the integrity of that idea hits its goal and metric. So all of these things, I know that, you know, all the different programs and things are on your website. Some of these other ideas are not, but I would like to tell everyone who is watching right now, please check out the other things that Fred does. Check out the website, become familiar. There are things, if you're watching this, I know you're a part of the community. You are working on the community. You are forward thinking enough to still be tuned in and probably want to make a change. You want to act on some of these things. Please get involved. Check out the Facebook groups, all of those things, because we need everyone to be a part of the solution. So I would Fred, definitely go I, ahead. <laughs> no, I would just reiterate 100% that we're collaborative in nature. We don't believe that we have all the answers. We're extremely excited to connect with the Latinx community, Hispanic community. Um, a myriad of communities that, to be honest with you, we have to break bread with. We have to get to know. Um, I don't perceive to have a panacea on the, the problems that exist within those ecosystems. I know they exist. I know they're problematic. And, you know, one of my, one of the goals I have this year in 2022 is to extend the olive branch, the bridge, whatever the parable is to the Hispanic and Latinx communities and others, LGBTQ as well, to really say, we're here. We might not have all the answers. We definitely don't have all the answers. We don't have all the money, uh, but we want to listen and figure out if there's anything we can do to help. We want to do so, and we want to do it in partnership with you and not transactionally. And I think that's been a challenge for people, to be honest with you. I think People just want to get a check from us. And that's not what we really do. Like, you know, we spend, when I took over, we made we made a decision in 2.1 contacts. Meaning 2.1 times you talk to us, you either got a check or you didn't, or you know, something was done, you got services. Now it's like 8.5. Right? We spend way more time with people, which is it puts a lot of toll on my team. But when they come to us and say, I want to support this activity. I know that they've spent the time with it. The second thing that we've done is we removed my bias as the CEO on grant making. So we partnered with Pitts Crab, the Community Research Advisory Board, and the Crab vets all of our grants and gives us a score back on our grants. And those scores allow certain potential grantees to move up or down in the uh, positioning to get a, receive a grant from us, but I would say they move them up or down to be partners with us that we make investments in. Nobody fails, but if you don't hit the metric, our team works with you until you get to that point. And so, you know, the science that we really in, invest in is how can we exhibit our humanity? How can we exhibit being patient with other people? And then how do we help them find the pathway that's most suitable for their desires 
And at the conclusion, how do we ensure that they're better off as a result of that engagement? So in all of these things, we have these big questions to solve. And of course, like we said, we are more likely to solve them and find those answers together. But I want to ask you, how do we as a society and as a city, as an organization, how do we ask ourselves these bigger questions to get to the solutions? That's a great question. I think we have to really understand, you know, what I've been pushing for the last four years, five years, probably six years is in most cities I've ever visited and been to, they always have a very clear North Star. Like, what is this, you know, what are we focused on as a city? What are we all galvanizing our interests around? And I think Pittsburgh has the potential to have three combinating or combining North Stars. One is our is our technology sector, two is our medical field, and three is our educational systems. And so if those three entities all agreed that we wanted to create the best leaders for artificial intelligence and robotics and data sovereignty and connect that to um, sustainable, uh, sustainable ecosystems looking at stormwater runoff, gray water reuse, geothermal systems, solar farms, uh, SIPs and such, you know, whatever that might be. If we agree on producing that, then all of us could galvanize every ounce of our energy to produce the practitioners that are needed to support our ecosystem. As such today, there's approximately 40,000 kids that graduate a year from Southwestern PA and 20,000 of them leave the day after graduation. And so we're bleeding talent. And how do we stop bleeding talent is by creating pipelines and opportunities for people who are interested in staying in Pittsburgh to be part of the emerging ecosystem and not as somebody who comes in and works under a particular organization or person or persons. But moreover, how do we optimize their academic proficiency to help organizations reimagine and rethink their work? And how do we invite them in to be partners? And this is where it gets tricky because sometimes very, very smart people have information, but not knowledge. They have access to data, but they don't understand the emotional content associated with the data. And so I think there's a marriage to be had between the merging of technology and human-centered design in which you put in the person first, and what are the elements that you measure that engagement by that really ensures the integrity of your work? Thank you so much. This has been such an enlightening and inspirational conversation. I feel like I could talk to you probably all day, every day, and just take it in and collaborate, but that that's exactly what you guys are doing and not not just with me, not just with any one organization, but with a ton of organizations here in Pittsburgh and even globally. So we are so proud and blessed to have you here in Pittsburgh. Thank you for all the work that you do. And thank you for sharing it with us today, Fred. Melody, thank you for having us on. And of course, we are definitely interested in working with the Latinx community and, and beyond. And so please don't hesitate to reach out if there's something you would like to check out, please go to our website. You're more than welcome to participate in our call for community solutions on Monday at 10 o'clock. They're very informative. Some people might not find them to be exciting, but when you have two of the highest ranking people, for example, at the state level, to come in and walk you through the budget, that's getting it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. You're getting it directly from people who live and work in that space, and you're in a position to offer them feedback on stuff they might have omitted. And we had that conversation today uh, with some of the people who were um, representing this work. And I, I use that as an example because when I, Mark and Diana talked about the role they play with the PA analysis uh, on the PA Budget and Policy Center, uh, we were able to give them feedback on things they just didn't look at. And that wouldn't happen if we weren't in close proximity with them as decision makers and there's a community of practice where we can actually say, we know for a fact that this is an issue because of X. And so 
we do that every week. Uh, we put ourselves in a position to bring those content experts to the table, not for us, but for the community. And so we ask the community to come and participate. They're an hour long from 10 to 11. Um, they're definitely worth uh, their weight in gold. We had, I think, UPMC on UPMC on last week. They're going to be launching a series of community engagement centers um, similar to Pitt. And so they're looking for feedback. And right, one of the things that I'm challenged with is when organizations like this open up the door, sometimes we're hesitant because we don't believe it's real. And I used to be uh, a person who was skeptical. And I, at times I still am. But one of the things I learned over the years is if I don't actually get engaged and say I had the experience or what it felt like for me, I can't condemn the effort. I really have to say, I don't know because I didn't participate. And so one of the things we really try to do is say, here's a chance for you to participate. Here's a chance for you to lean in, listen and learn. And ultimately you could define the essence of your engagement by saying, hey, this is what I wanna do. And you know, we wanna support what you wanna do, not what we want you to do. So it's a different, it's a different kind of construct. It is a partnership to move everyone forward together. And that is a consistent line that I see through everything you do, you know, not thinking that we have all the answers and that when we collaborate, we can identify more things. You know, you can work on something forever and ever, and you are not going to see your own blind spots. So I definitely agree that this is this is the path forward. And I'm really glad that you are a part of it and that you invite the community to be a part of it as well. So thank you again, Fred. Thank you very much. And thanks for having us on the show. And we would love to come back again if you invite us. This was great. Absolutely. And thank all of you guys for tuning in. We want to thank Coca-Cola for sponsoring. We sponsor different Hispanic initiatives all over the United States, and we're very grateful to have them as a partner. The Latino Pittsburgh Digital Speaker Series is an initiative of the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Its goals are to share relevant information, inspire growth, and foster opportunity. Speakers and workshops include community leaders and members, as well as other individuals and programs that have a positive impact, not only on the Hispanic community, but Pittsburgh as a region. If you'd like to become a speaker or like more information about the chamber, please visit www.pmahcc.org. Thanks. Adios.